This time on episode 454 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we're talking the 2022 film Black Panther Wakanda Forever and weekly Marvel news, including why Wakanda Forever villain Namor won't get his own standalone. Chris Hemsworth explains why he hasn't watched Tom Hiddleston's Loki and the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 trailer. I'm Anthony Sitko from Capes on the Couch, a show that examines the mental health issues of comic book characters, part of the Guinea Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other stupendously geeky shows at GuinaGeekNetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the S.H.I.E.L.D. director. Now it's time for your scheduled debriefing. I'm Agent Lauren. I'm Agent Michelle. I'm Agent Chris. And I'm producer of the show, Director SP. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. We're a Marvel Comic Universe fan show and we discuss the Marvel Cinematic and Comic Book Universes as told on screen by a little company that could be bought out by Apple pretty soon called Marvel Studios. The show is recorded on Saturday, December 3rd, 2022, live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast worldwide via www.geeks.live. Come and join our live chat as we record. And if you didn't already know about it, we like talking about Marvel. Because of driving physics. If you'd like to share your favorite example of driving physics, you can find us at our website, legendsofshield.com. If you want to give us some real-time updates on how physics is affecting your driving, leave us a voicemail at 844-THE-BUS-1. That's 844-843-2871. You can find us on Facebook, Legends of Shield Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Legends of Shield. You can also find us on YouTube at Gunna Geek. You can join our Discord server at gunnageek.com slash Discord. And remember, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a proud member of the gunnageek.com network. You know, my son just moved to the Twin Cities basically over the summer, and he got his first taste of driving physics this past week in six inches of snow as he's going back and forth to Minneapolis. He's got a four by four. He said he, he can handle it, but he was like, wow, this is wow. <laughs> that was me a couple weeks ago. I it was terrifying. <laughs> I am not used to it. Yeah, he's calling me and he's talking to me over the bridge, the I-35 E South Bridge coming south of uh, St. Paul. And he's like, yeah, this is all sporty. I'm like, yep, I was sideways on that bridge in a Caprice Classic coming back from high school. He's like, you did what? It's like, yep, I was sideways on that bridge. And he's like, well, how fast were you going? Well, let's just say it was too fast for conditions and let's just leave it at that. So anyway, yes, uh, we're going to talk about driving and Black Panther and a whole bunch of stuff that happened in Wakanda forever. Driving is probably the least thing that we're going to talk about, but I'm ready to talk about it. The movie's been out for a few weeks. I know everybody wants to hear us talking about it, so let's get talking about it, right? Yes. Black Panther Wakanda Forever premiered in the United States on November 11th, 2022, just a little under a month since we're recording this. The IMDb description of the movie says the people of Wakanda fight to protect their homes from intervening world powers as they mourn the death of King T'Challa. Michelle, who directed the movie? This movie was directed by Ryan Coogler, has nine directing credits starting in 2009 including Fruitville Station, Creed, Black Panther, Black Panther, Wanda, Wakanda Forever. And Lauren, who were the writers for the show? So again, for writer, we have Ryan Coogler, who has seven writing credits since 2009, including Fruitville Station, Creed, Black Panther, Creed 2, 
Wakanda Forever and the upcoming Creed 3, which I saw a trailer for before Wakanda Forever. And was there another writer for the show, Lauren? Yes, it was co-written by Joe Robert Cole, who has five writing credits starting in 2011, including Amber Lake, two episodes of American Crime Story, Black Panther, All Day and a Night, and Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. So we each took a main cast member that we're going to go into a little bit more in depth. We're going to start with Michelle. I wanted to talk about Letitia Wright, who plays Shuri. First, she did a good job in the film. I want to address, is there going to be a Black Panther 3? Not anytime soon. Letitia Wright, yes, she is now the Black Panther. But she doesn't have enough, I don't know, acting experience, screen presence, gravitas in order to carry an entire film. As we talk about the film later on, I'm going to make a case that this is more of an ensemble film. But for right now, I just wanted to acknowledge, yes, she did a good job. But I don't think we're going to see a Shuri standalone Black Panther film. It's an interesting thought. I'm going to seed the thought right now that I think it's the same as we talked last week with Thor, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Anybody else have anything to say real quick about Ms. Wright? Nope. All right, Lauren, you're up. Okay, as Namor, we have Teno Chuerta, who is a Mexican actor who's been in just so much stuff, but primarily Mexican. The ones that I want to briefly talk about are Narcos Mexico, The Forever Purge. Those are like, I guess, two of his biggest English ones. Tigers Are Not Afraid, which is a Mexican magical realism horror movie, which is really good. And he was the lead role in a telenovela that I've been trying to track down, but is apparently not streaming anywhere called Blue Demon in which he plays the Blue Demon, a Mexican wrestler from back in the day in this kind of biopic sort of show. If you could have picked anyone else to play that role, would you have or would you have gone with him? I can't see anyone other than him now. Kind of hard after seeing him on the screen, right? He, uh, we'll talk about it. All right. Well, Chris, we're going to talk about somebody that's been around for a little while. Yep. And playing a big role in the movie, both from his character standpoint and just from the fact that he is a big boy, we have Winston Duke, who, as M'Baku in here, I think really did a good job of trying to show how much the death of T'Challa impacted him and his group of people, but also trying to do what is best for his people specifically. And just that little dynamic there of, are we starting to feel a little bit more empathetic toward him and then kind of losing it a little bit? I think he did a really good job with that. I think... It was amazing to see his growth in that he, as either the character or the actor, had a lot more gravitas to him. Like he was an elder of Wakanda. And it really came across on screen that he was an elder of Wakanda. So I don't know if that's either him or the writing, but either way or both. But he really pulled it off. And I was I was impressed as to his gravitas on screen. Especially, and we'll talk about it later, but especially the scene that he had specifically with Letitia because that was that was really well crafted across the board in my opinion anyway that's the exact one I was thinking of as well yeah I'm going to talk about another actor newcomer to the MCU really Dominique Thorne who played Riri Williams I have been looking forward to this for a long time I've made no quietness on the podcast about it really like the character that is in the comics. And even though they changed quite a bit from the comics to what we saw in the film, I think they brought the essence of the character out, uh, still at MIT, 
and still a genius and still really trying to struggle getting through life, basically, because she hasn't had the world handed to her like Tony Stark did. And I really appreciated that. And I look forward to talking to everybody else about it. But I think Dominique did a good job coming in. I have some concerns about the story and the plot uh, that was thrown in there, which we'll talk about later. But I think Dominique did a good job. I do, too. All right. So we're just going to jump right into overall thoughts because none of us really wanted to write a synopsis on a two hour, 45 minute movie that we saw in the theater once and couldn't remember anything. So, Lauren, we're going to start with you. Okay, this movie was an absolutely gorgeous look at grief. I know that like a lot of the more recent Marvel movies have been a look at grief, but this one really stands out. I cried, honest to God, five times during the movie, including before it even started. And the last time I did that with the movie was when Selena came out in 1997. The film honored the legacy of Chadwick Boseman while moving the story forward. Yeah, I couldn't get past those opening Marvel cinematics before my eyes started leaking and I don't regret any second of it. I think it was an entertaining film. It was a symbolic burning of the film or whatever morning device that you want to attribute to two years after Chadwick Boseman's passing. And I have some confusion as to the film's scope, which we'll talk about later. But we're going to start talking about Chadwick's impossible not to talk about this film without talking about Chadwick. And y'all mentioned it, the way that the film opened with the silent credit purple open, which purple is the color of Black Panther. And they took all those scenes out, all the quotes out, and they just threw Chadwick Boseman at us for however long it was 30 seconds it seemed like it was longer like maybe they extended it or something but they really went out of their way from the get-go to really say we're honoring chadwick with this film and i thought that was the right way to start it because he's a beloved actor his character was huge and they needed to carry on with the mcu somehow and specifically these characters so i had to do something i think it was the right call what do you guys think Oh, God, I I almost started wailing. I mean, and you knew you knew it going in, too. I knew it going in. And I was in a we went to an early afternoon showing. There was only like five people, including us in the theater. And I was trying to be considerate for those other three people. But I was so close to just like ugly crying. Oh, it was it hit so hard, but I I loved it. Yeah, it's like you go in there and and you know they're going to have to do something beautiful like that. And we know that the movie, just from all the trailers and stuff, has the death of T'Challa stuff built into it. So you know they're not going to just rely on that. Because what is it? You know, a 30 second thing. You throw that together an hour or two if you're taking way too long. And there, there's just no other way they really could have started the movie. And I like how they went forward with Shuri dramatically and drastically trying to save his life by doing the research and not showing him on a deathbed like they did with Carrie Fisher in Star Wars. I was dreading that, actually, and I'm glad they didn't show it. Like, maybe they didn't have the footage, they didn't want to do the CGI for it, or they just didn't want Chadwick being remembered that way. I don't know what the decision was. But I think it was the right way. I mean, I was touched by the whole thing. I didn't cry, but I was touched by the whole way that it was done. And then Shuri just missing it, but it wasn't a long shot anyway. Like the confidence level was like 25, 28%. So odds are it probably wouldn't have worked anyway. The whole trying to resynthesize the heart shaper because, yeah, it was destroyed in the last movie. I thought that was a really interesting way to try and like kind of tie into this. Shuri's panic and everything about that and the bargaining and everything. 
Yeah. If you've lost someone very close to you, you know all of those feelings. With the added guilt and anger of, she was, she's a genius. She's like, I should be able to figure this out. I should be able to do all of this. I should be able to save my brother. And God, that, that hit so hard. That opening was just, it was kind of perfect for me. I also liked how the public funeral, if you want to call it that, was more of a celebration. You know, everybody was decked out in white. They were dancing. Uh, everybody was honoring Chadwick or Black Panther in this case in Wakanda. And I liked how they didn't dive down because they knew everybody was going to be affected by it. So I liked how they didn't dive down into the typical Western style mourning funeral. It was more of a life celebration. And I, I appreciated that in the, in the film because if they didn't do that, it just would have been 15 minutes of just constant grief thrown at us. So I'm, I'm uh, appreciative that they didn't do that. I loved that they showed because, okay. There's a lot of cultures in Africa where, yeah, the funeral is, it's a celebration of life. You know, you're supposed to be joyous because they've gone on before you and yeah, you miss them, but you're celebrating them. And you can see this kind of that diaspora, the, the diaspora continued with that in like New Orleans funerals. If you are ever lucky enough, I guess, to see a New Orleans jazz funeral. They're beautiful. They're celebratory. Yeah, it's it's more of what I would want in a funeral instead of everyone just being sad. So afterwards, the movie broadens out in its scope and goes worldwide and goes with somebody looking for vibranium and they find vibranium at the bottom of the ocean with a vibranium detector and then they try to go at it and then we see the first of Namor's people come in and really wreak havoc there but that opens it up to Everett Ross's character Agent Ross and I don't know if that whole storyline the entire story I don't know if that's necessary I mean I get that you want to bring the character of Ross forward, but that was, I don't know. It was so disconnected. It was like, why are we even seeing this, especially in a two hour, 45 minute movie that could have probably be cut down to two hours without those scenes. Gotta have a white person. <laughs> He's a token ouch. white guy. Ouch, yeah. true. But ouch. Shuri's favorite colonizer. Yeah. And then I also, I think they were trying to, I know SP, you're talking about the scope of the movie. And we have to realize that they, they started this with Chasman still, you know, alive and everything. So there had to be rewrites. This is supposed to be close to phase 400, I, whatever one we're on. And they're trying to see because they brought in Valentina, Julie Louise Dreyfus, who we've seen in Falcon and a Winter Soldier reestablishing that character their exes their ex-spouses okay that was a stretch but their scenes she julie louise dreyfus has a long list of emmys for a reason she brings something to the screen she's always she gives 150 percent, no matter how much screen time she has whether it's you know an hour or two minutes to me she made those scenes with him and it's like, okay, I can see what they're trying to do and how they're trying to link vibranium or just the existence of this secret government part within the secret government part within the secret government part of the United States to lead into like thunderbolts and all that type of stuff. Yeah, it's also, I think, an effort to try and make it you know, to, to give the outsider's perspective of this is truly a worldwide thing and also to get information to where it needed to be. But I agree, those sections felt really disconnected, even though I absolutely love Val. She's like a way more competent Selena Meyer from Veep. 
I think a lot of it too could be uh, plot threads being dropped for future projects. You have to have him involved somehow. So he already has a relationship with these characters. You get him in and then you've got that connection and whatever comes next where he needs to show up. Marvel used to be very much more subtle about it. It was really good English there. But anyway, Marvel used to be more subtle about it. And this was like hitting us over the head with a sledgehammer versus a like, let's sprinkle it in. Because if that's true, what you're saying, Chris, it's like, all right, so you couldn't figure out a way to do it that was better. Your creativity, you, we spent, we, we give you guys millions of dollars to give us a good story. And this is the best you could do sort of thing. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Well, everyone has that one section of the essay that they're not really looking forward to doing. It just kind of breeze through because you have to do this to get to the other part. And I think that kind of showed. Yeah, because the other weak point for me was how they got Riri in. Like she happened to build a vibranium detector, but for some reason, no one backward engineered it so they can build their own. She is the only one that can do it, which, okay. But once they got her in, I really liked her. I do like how they find vibranium at the bottom of the ocean. They are right. The surface of the earth, 70% water. Most of the things land in the water. And making Namor's place underwater Wakanda was amazing. Once we got into that and we got over how Riri was introduced, I was just, I liked her with Shuri and everything. But I understand there are parts that were just like, wow, this is, these are bumps. But in an overall, I think, fantastic film, I think we're nitpicking, which is with something, you know, there's a film this good where we have to like nitpick little things, I think says a lot. And even when we nitpick so far, it's been like, but it led to something else. So I think that's the sign of a pretty good movie. I'm going to continue to nitpick here. But before I do that, I want to close off the. I don't know, Everett Ross part of it and just say Richard Schiff, his character was not named, right? He was in the West Wing. He came across totally, and maybe this is just Richard Schiff and how he acts, but he came across completely as Toby Ziegler from the West Wing, right? So West Wing part of the MCU or is that canon now? Have we decided? It's not because his character wasn't named. His character, even in the credits, is U.S. Secretary of State. Which means that there's still a chance. There's still a chance, but we can't officially call it. You can headcanon it. Yeah, so that was cool. So, all right, another nitpick. And this isn't necessarily bad when you're talking about you're supposed to be paying attention to a movie. But I know like 10, 20 years from now when I'm watching this on Disney Plus and streaming it, I'm not going to be watching it the entire time. And it is the issue of subtitles. Yes, they created these wonderful languages for Wakanda and for Namor's people. It was totally subtitled, and I just wish that it wasn't that much, because on the first viewing, it's okay, but on the 10th viewing, it's not going to be okay. So first of all, neither of those languages are created. True. Wakanda, and they speak, and I know I'm going to mess this up because this isn't a sound that I do normally, but I can't do it. X H O S A. My instinct is to say Joseph, but the X is like a like a clicking sound. And the language that the people of Talagan speak is actually a dialect of Maya that they speak in the Yucatan, which oh my god, I was so happy. Just ugh, so happy. I loved that we got a chance to hear those. I was so ready to just hear them speak in Spanish. Because I figured somebody would go in there and say, oh, Mexico, Spanish, done. I am, you don't know how happy I am that they didn't do that. I was just thrilled about everything. I went into this thinking at first that it was going to be Nawal that they were speaking, but that's more of a, a central Mexican thing, like central and a little more north. The Mayans were very much in like the... Southern Mexico, Guatemala, very much the central 
part of Mexico, uh, the central part of Central America. And I have so much to say about everything that they did with Talukan. I don't know if this is the time to talk about that yet or. Well, I just want to close it out by saying I think there were too many subtitles in the film for what it was. I understand the languages. I actually really like the fact that they did the languages, but I don't like the subtitle part of it. And that's kind of odd for me to say because I watch movies with subtitles all the time, but I don't want to be forced to look at the screen the entire time. Like I said, the first viewing through or maybe first handful of viewings, great. But we're talking about something historically that's going to be around. Like, I still watch Iron Man from 2008, right? So. I think by the time I'm watching this, you know, the 10th time, I'm going to know plot wise what's going on when I hear certain voices say certain things because I know how much time has passed and I know what point in the story they are. Mm -hmm. All right. Also, you'll have a rewind button on the remote. Yeah, no, no, I no, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So, yeah, I, in my opinion, too many subtitles, but that's just my opinion. Y'all seem fine with it. So there you go. And yes, let's talk about. Talokan, is that how you pronounce it? Talokan. Okay, let's talk about it. Okay, so first of all, there's a lot of Mayan references, obviously. Namor's real name being Kukulkan, which is the Mayan feathered serpent, which is the equivalent to the Aztec Quetzalcoatl. And that was just perfect for me because it's like the explanation of the pointed wings to reach up to the sky and the feathered ankles and because Kukukan is the winged serpent and the messenger of the gods and oh it was so cool for me to have that connection there and then of course the um un niño sin amor for, for how he got namor there was a tweet that I saw a while back on Mexican Twitter of somebody saying that they were bringing their dad to it. They're like, yeah, this guy, you know, Namor. He's like, Namor, si Namor. And they're like, no, no, no. His name in the comics is Namor. And then after they got out of the movie, he was like, I was right. Okay, so the name Talokan. So in the comics, this is obviously Atlantis. But because we already have that with the DCU, I was really happy that Marvel decided to go another way. So, the god of storms and water with the Mayans is Chuck, but in Aztec mythology, it's Tlaloc, which is, you know, the same, the same function. And Tlaloc's kingdom is Tlalocan, which is, you know, the underwater place where, like, uh, victims of drownings go when they die. And here we have these people escaping colonialism because, you know, obviously the, the Spanish came and conquered everything and it really sucked and they enslaved indigenous people. And part of the reason for the triangle trade starting was because they sort of massacred all the people they were intending to enslave. So, to escape that, we had the, you know, the, the Mayans who had technically their own version of the heart-shaped herb, which gave them the ability to live underwater. And because Namor's mother was pregnant, so in a lot of cases, there's a lot of medications that you're not supposed to take when you're pregnant because they are mutagens, which doesn't, doesn't mean you get the cool powers. It just means that it, it messes with your genetics but here he and i want to say in canon he's also no no the first mutant was uh, el sabanor but yeah namor is a mutant in the comics and them actually saying the m word here was amazing i loved everything they did visually with talukan where you see a lot of the the mayan kind of adornments being made out of sea life like instead of, you know, like a like a jaguar or something, we have a tuma with the hammerhead. And instead of feathers, we have that Namora was wearing was were lionfish 
spins. And oh, it was just, it made my heart so happy. <laughs> Chris, how do you feel about the mutants? I love getting mutants in here. We've snuck mutants in a little bit before. We have mutants super canonically 1000% in here now. We can have X Men. We're going to, we can do that. We can have so much stuff opened up. And just sticking with the comics accurate history of Namor, too, because this could have really easily just dropped that out. Nobody outside of super nerds like us would have even noticed. And even the people like us who would have noticed, I don't know how many people would have cared. But you've got Namor being a mutant from five billion years ago, because I can't tell time and that kind of math anymore. And like just having all, of, I don't, it's too many. <laughs> but just having all of that in here. Wait a minute, you work in finance, right? <laughs> Not anymore. I actually switched very recently. It doesn't matter. I don't have to do math anymore. Yeah, okay. That makes sense now. So, it's just great. You come in here, and he just throws it around so casually, yeah, I'm a mutant. Like, what? That's a big deal, dude. Come on. Except, you know, he has kind of essentially been living under a rock for a while. So what, we have two official mutants in the MCU right now, Miss Marvel and Namor? Yes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have guessed. Those would have been the first two. Okay. That's pretty cool, actually. I mean, if you're going to do it, do it. And we've been wanting Namor into the universe since, since we started this podcast. Haley and Lauren always used to say, oh, let's get Namor. And they always said, oh, they, he's a dick, but let's get Namor. <laughs> Imperious sex. Come on. It's. Also, I was glad that when they had him saying that he was he wasn't saying it in Latin because that would make no sense. That's the language of the oppressors. But they had him say, I guess, essentially the king rules or whatever in Mayan. I loved that. It's like, let's have him say his catchphrase, but have it make sense. I think a couple of the. So I kind of get where he's coming from and where his people are coming from where he wants to wipe out everybody on the surface because of what he witnessed when he was a kid. But there, and there are people like that in the world. I just, I thought it was a good tie in because of Killmonger. Namor is one of those quote unquote, I don't like using the word villain. I prefer antagonist. Because one of the things I saw this, you know, with mom and my cousin, it was just like, yeah, Namor is kind of a jerk. There's a better word for that, but this is a clean podcast. And considering Shuri sees Killmonger and we're dealing with grief and anger, there is that whole, I, how many wars have been fought because of resources? You have that and I want it. And you have to share it. No, we don't have to share it. Look at that UN scene. The world is pressuring Wakanda to share vibranium or to give United States control over it. You can't handle it, Wakanda, even though you've been doing it for centuries. Us white people need to do what we've been doing. And it's like, you're the last part of Africa. We haven't colonized in any sort of way. We need to do that. We need to, you know, fill in. We need to color that part in and such. And it's just like that whole idea. I thought it was a good counterpoint because, again, we have underwater Wakanda versus on land Wakanda. But on land Wakanda doesn't want to wipe out all of the surface world. Well, okay. So this whole story is about, I mean, well, it's partially about reactions to colonialism and imperialism. You had Wakanda separating themselves back in the day and, you know, isolating themselves, not even, you know, giving any real attention to the plight of, you know, everybody else from the African continent. And you have Talokan, who, in order to avoid complete genocide, 
escaped and became very isolationist there. And with both cultures, it was this whole, okay, as long as we stay here, nobody will bother us. There's also, I would like to point out, a very religious aspect to vibranium. With Wakanda, we didn't see it as much with Talokan. But with Wakanda, it's like, this is our sacred trust. There's a reason why they didn't want people stealing it out of Wakanda in the first movie and in Civil War and everything. It wasn't just, oh, it's dangerous. It was, this is our sacred responsibility. And with the case of both Killmonger and Namor, these are people who lived outside for, or at least saw the outside effects of imperialism and colonialism. Namor, you know, he saw a genocide. His, his people survived a genocide. And Killmonger lived in the after effects of colonialism and slavery and the, you know, long, ugly legacy that we've been left with because of it. And with both of them, that exposure made them just angry and it made them want to lash out, like in, including in Namor's case, very much doing the whole, if you're not with us, you're against us. And Wakanda basically being their target of opportunity because it's, they're their first big threat. And with both cases, it's yes, it's an overreaction to this very, very real evil that was done. But with both, well, Killmonger died, but with Namor and then with Shuri in this movie, they realize that, like, you can't isolate yourself, whether it's Namor isolating his people or Shuri cutting herself off from, like, you know, her family, her family's dead. Her father, mother, brother, all dead. And if she had let herself, she could have isolated herself. She could have been a tyrant. She could have, you know, done all this horrible stuff. She was so close to doing all this horrible stuff. But because she had those influences with, you know, her brother and her mother and all the people around her, M'Baku, and her favorite colonizer, all of that, that gives her a bit of a wider vision than Namor's. Because she isn't isolated. The whole thing here is, you are not isolated in your grief. And I loved all of that. Now that I've talked for a half hour. Well, you did mention Killmonger. We should talk about him because, well, Michael B. Jordan actually made an appearance in the film. Shuri, when she goes into the astral plane, she finds Killmonger. And that was an interesting choice indeed. Why did you take why did you take the herb, little cousin? Why did you do it? Grief is difficult. I'm not like you. Oh yes, you are. I just again, Michael B. Jordan, all the things. It was just interesting. It was I heard he came back and a lot of people were just like, How? And when she takes the herb and he's there, I'm hitting my head. It's like of course. And of course he would be there. He was a Black Panther for a bit. And right now he's the one that she has the most in common with because, again, that anger. She also sees her mom later on. I don't know if that's a vision for her, like a memory, or if that's like a vision which brings up all sorts of issues. I mean, was she... A Black Panther at one point in time. We just didn't know about it. That would have been cool. Or was she just remembering? Or can you see other family members in the astral plane? I don't know. But that did happen, not as she took the herb, but later. So there's a point at which I think it functionally doesn't matter where the, whether the, this is an actual vision or her imagination. The point is, there's enough of her mother left in her that she will she'll never be without her truly it's the whole you live on in the actions that affect the people around you and then when sherry gets out from 
I don't know, trance dream, whatever you want to call it. She gets out and then she just gets mad. Like she, cause she sees Killmonger. Like I, I want to see my brother. I wanted to see my father. You know, I wanted to see all these people. I see Killmonger as she hits one of the suits. <laughs> it just goes out and she's like, Hmm. Yeah. And then like, well, I guess you need a suit. <laughs> You're the black Panther now. So she gets to be black Panther and she gets to, be the tip of the spear, not necessarily. I mean, she was always princess. She never assumed being queen or monarch of Wakanda. She was just the princess. And they go into the final battle. And this is one of the issues of scope that I had. So you have these two great big societies. And you even have Namor saying, I have more warriors than you can imagine, right? So I'm thinking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions. I have no idea how big a society is. And you have Wakanda. And we've seen the Wakanda battle against Thanos. You know, you had all those warriors out there. And they isolated it to a ship in the sea. So, all right, you're scoping it down. And then you have like a handful of Wakandans left at the end. It's like, and, and you don't have the massive waves of warriors from Namor. I just had an issue with scope at that point in time. I'm like, this should be two societies coming at each other and you're via plot or whatever, you're isolating it to a few dozen people. It just didn't seem right to me. No, if Namor is going to be coming, trying to take over Wakanda, like this is just horrible war tactics. You have all these people, you don't try to stretch things out. You go in, you smash everybody and you get done especially if you're in a place where they can't survive in the environment. That is how you have, like, don't invade Russia in the winter. That is how you have, make sure you keep the high ground on stuff. Like, you use your environment, you use your massive numbers advantage, and you go win. You don't try to make a fair fight with it. You also follow Geneva Conventions and don't take out civilians, but that's a whole different issue. Because in his first attack, he kills the queen, and there's that whole new wave of grief. But at the end, he says that we're now Wakanda's only friend, and when Wakanda needs help, they have to call to us. That last fight, was he not showing all his cards for a reason? I'm Maybe that. No, I think if he takes out Wakanda, he is now the world superpower. So I don't think he would have held back any cards from that tactically and strategically. It just doesn't make any sense. Other than, like I said, plot says we need to scope this down. And remember, this was all filmed, I, I believe, during the pandemic. So they had pandemic restrictions against them the entire time. I'm thinking, right? Yes. So that could have thrown in there as well, but it just, it just didn't d jive to me at the end. The other thing that didn't jive to me at the end is I know Shuri has had a lot of flight training because she was saying there's a whole website dedicated to, you know, spotting her or whatever. I think I could be a mistake, but I think that was an homage to the, all the LA, you know, flying men that have been spotted in airliners and whatever. But anyway, so she's saying that and she's got flight training, but she's got no fight training flight but no fight training right and then i have no idea what weapon she she's used and what weaponry she's not used in the suit right and i have no idea if uh, a roadie has been involved or not at this point so for her to enter into a major battle like that it was it was it, I, there's no training montage. We didn't get a training montage for Shuri. It just doesn't jive for me. And and yes, she doesn't do anything that's that's huge and acrobatic or requires a lot of of I don't know moves and stuff. It just why do you throw basically a kid into that situation just because she's got a suit? I it's like I don't know. I think it's basic training. You're a princess. You need to know how to defend yourself. Oh, I'm Here's sorry. Some... I, I said, sure. I met Riri the entire time. I met Riri. Oh. 
Well, Riri's a genius and she built her suit. Maybe it's programmed. But even Stark had training time. Stark is an old man, though, and Riri has the advantage of knowing that video games exist and how to use them. So she probably just went and played some Gundam games. <laughs> Made a VR trading program for herself or something. I, that doesn't really bother me because this isn't her story. I wouldn't be surprised if we get flashbacks in Armor Wars or something, but Riri is basically a plot device in this one. I know, and that's what kind of bugs me, because, I mean, if you're going to put her... Even with Shang-Chi, we had a small training montage, because we had, what, a week before that final battle, and there was that training montage? And we have a week here, and Riri gets no training. I was like, eh, I don't know. It doesn't jive. Plus, she hangs out with all the Dora Milaje. Well, yeah. Wait, no, not. Out. I'm. I'm still thinking Shuri. Sorry. Yeah. I was kind of glad that we got Riri in this because it avoids us having to do yet another superhero origin story whenever Armor Wars comes out. We can just kind of okay. This is who this is. Let's jump right into it. And also, she has her own show coming. Yes. So it didn't, it didn't really bother me. It's not the time. I guess. It just bugs me sending a 19 year old into a fight without any training. And yes, she's a strong person and very intelligent and she's got a lot of fight in her. It's just, yeah. all right. One thing I wanted to mention, so I kind of fully predicted as the movie was going on that Nakia and T'Challa had hooked up and had a baby because that would explain why she wasn't around. That would explain why she was, you know, concentrating on the school in Haiti. And when he shows up at the end and he says his name was Toussaint, I started bawling. Because Toussaint Louverture, who I know I'm mispronouncing that name because I don't speak French, was instrumental in Haitian independence. And yeah, that just, oh, that hit me hard. And then, of course, you know, yeah, my father was, again, I was wailing or trying not to wail. It was beautiful. He was so sure of himself on screen. And one other thing I wanted to talk about, I am so happy that Ryan Coogler has continued to cast dark-skinned folk, not only with the Wakandans, which again, you would expect because they don't have the legacy of intermarrying with white people. And I loved that because there's a lot of prejudice against darker skinned black people in movies darker skinned black women especially and with namor so tenochtitla is actually of indigenous ancestry his great grandmother whatever his relatives are oh noa and uh purepecha and the thing is in Mexico, they tend to cast actors and stuff that look like me. So there's this very big, you know, colorism is huge in Mexico. And it's to the point where, you know, his, his bio, which you can find on, you know, anywhere, but also on Audible, where he narrates it, is called Orgullo Prieto, which means dark-skinned pride. Mexican Twitter, like truly Mexican Twitter, not Mexican-American Twitter, was horrible to him during all of this because he is a dark-skinned, indigenous-descended actor. And you'll see a lot, you know, here you see a lot of, oh my God, Tenochtitl is so hot, blah, blah, blah. And there it's like, why did they cast someone so ugly? He's all dark and ugly. And it's, it's really horrific. But I was so happy and I'm so happy to see people considering him attractive 
and it's you know it, it's stuff i didn't see as a kid you don't you didn't see you only saw dark-skinned mexican characters on tv when they're criminals and maids and stuff like that and here you have him as this very very desirable sex symbol now i'm just i'm so happy i'm again this is more movies need to take the stuff into account and do conscious casting of you know just be aware of when you cast these people and not these people, what you are saying. New moment, Lauren. Uh. New Lauren? <laughs> okay. So I want to back up a second back to T'Challa's son. And he was so sure of himself in talking to his aunt who he'd never met before. Kind of knew that this was the first meeting and just was like, yep, I'm, I'm this, but I'm not ready yet. So I'm just going to stay here and it was a wonderful end to the movie i did read an article that said that it wasn't supposed to happen at the end of the film it was supposed to happen in the middle of the film i don't know how they were going to all mesh that together maybe it was during the grief to the queen's death but i think it was well placed it gives us a future for the character for the ip of black panther and I think it was the right thing to do to put that in there. It, was, it just made sense story-wise to do it. And I appreciated how they ended the film on an upbeat in the mid credit scene. We haven't talked about Ramonda at all. I think she went off the rails a little bit a couple of times, but... <clears throat> it's... I think she was in this movie as both an example of, you know, dignity and strength to Shuri, but also as an example of destructive grief. Yeah, just going completely off the rails with you took my daughter on this mission and then you let her get captured and even though you've done everything possible to be good for your country and your people here, I'm just going to completely throw you out of everything. It was understandable to me that she would feel that way. I'd like to think that I, if I was in that situation, I would feel that way and kind of lock myself in a room at least overnight so I can calm down and not actually act on it. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of why you have your counsel in court. So you don't make super destructive decisions like that. Yeah, there was even the comment of let's not be hasty or rash or I forget the exact line, but the council did caution. Oh, speaking of the council, R.I.P. the woman who played the merchant tribe elder. She died, I guess, shortly after filming her scenes. She was played by Dorothy Steele, who was, I believe, like. She was up there. She was like in her late 90s, early 100s when she died. Huh. 26 to 21. So 95. 95. Yeah. 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 She died in October of last year. Well, now also, Michelle had a note here that I absolutely wanted to hit, and it was that uh, this was a female-led cast, basically. And Michelle, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, we have the power of black women. We had Ramona, Riri, Shuri, Nakia, Okoyo. I got, I, I, I'm going to put out there that this is an ensemble film. We had sure interact with a lot of other people there's a lot of teamwork coming together fighting everything talking about grief but this is a female-led cast they are black and as lauren was saying we have dark skin this is a film it's making money because it's a good film and you can have strong women who are to, who are complex it's one of the things they are not one note they are complex we're talking about 
you know, how Ramonda dealt with grief, how Shuri did this and, you know, how they're, they're not all pretty. They're not all one note. They're complicated. They have intriguing interpersonal relationships. They are just there and amazing. And this, the power of just women, the power of black women, and it's making money and it's not flopping. And we have, as Lauren even said, the antagonist, as I would like to label him, dark skin actor. I talked about, we had the token white guy who we really could have done with that, you know, lampshade. He could have just been a voicemail or something. Uh, I think is amazing. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up voicemail because that's exactly what we got in Thor with, uh, what's his name? I want to say Skarsgar. Uh, Eric Selvig. Yeah, Eric Selvig. That, that's basically what we got. And he's been like that in a few films, actually, not just Thor. But yeah, Ross could have been that. But to get back to your point, Michelle, you bring this up all the time. Bechtel test. Oh, my God. Good Lord. Oh, God. Yes. And so many others. I was just like, this is just amazing on so many levels. It's just amazing to see representation matters and when you have a good story and you have good writing and you have good directing you're not looking at it's not you know all of a sudden it's not like look at us we we are representation that's what we need more of we need, we want more of these stories no there's just a layer of things that i wouldn't have get like my people could not have made this movie. I'm sorry. There's just a level of things that we just don't get. We have to have certain voices and we need more of these voices. I want more of these voices coming out and their take on superheroes and just their own stories and their own superheroes and their own myths, their own legends. Give me more Mayan stuff. And, uh, you know, as I have, I am done with the dwarves being like Vikings. We've had a lot of Viking stuff. We've had a Queen Victoria, Henry VIII, all those stuff. We've had enough of that. Give us ancient Maya. Give us ancient Inca stuff. There are kings and queens or, and stuff that are fascinating there. I'm sure there's a lot of backstabbing and glory and awesome stuff. We don't need Greek and Roman stuff anymore. We've had that. We, we know that. Let's bring out all these things that I have no clue. Because one of the things I'm just sitting here listening to Lauren because I have no idea about any of these things. And that's wrong. I should know some of these things. We should know some of these things. Absolutely. Don't want to minimize what you're saying. It is really cool to see these sorts of projects now coming out of the MCU. I know that there was a dedicated movement afoot to get more diversity and representation in the MCU. And I'm completely okay with it. One thing that I wanted to bring up is I saw a story that there was a conscious decision not to have a romance connection between Shuri and Namor. And I think that worked way better. So you didn't have the spurned lover fight at the end. You literally have the leaders, quote unquote, of both of their societies clashing. I think that worked way better than the romance angle on this. So kudos for not going in that direction. I mean, I could see it too, right? But I, kudos for not taking that direction. I think it worked well. Yeah, I went into this shipping both Shuri and Namor and Shuri and Riri. I mm. think both of them, all three of them, well, both pairs, I thought, had amazing chemistry with each other. I would like to know what Chris thought, because you brought up M'Baku before. So what were you thinking when it came to him? Mostly with him. I really liked how he wasn't... Part of it was the romance thing. Not having anything with that from anybody really was good. But going in, yes... I know that you're in this crappy time right now. I know your family is all gone. 
you know, we're going to be friendly to you. We're going to take care of you and make sure that your people are all right. Cause I mean, there's our little groups of stuff, but we're all Wakandans. So we're going to make sure we're all taken care of. And then kind of slipping into a little bit of the, I'm going to make sure that my people kind of can get something out of this if we can. Maybe you can do something to really help all of us out. But we're, we're really going to take care of you. So it, it felt really realistic to me because I don't think people, especially as we've seen in Baku in the previous film, I don't think people can ever really get away from who they are and what they've been. and he's just grown up with that little chip on his shoulder or probably a big chip on his shoulder in his case. And yes, he's grown, but he still has a bit of a ways to go if he wants to. He's not wrong into challenging for the leadership. Who else is there? Yeah. Shuri, I don't think ever had any interest in leading she just wanted to be in her lab and doing doing stuff to, you know, advance Wakandan technology and everything like that. I don't think she probably saw herself as making a very good leader because of that, as opposed to T'Challa, who was like raised knowing that he was going to get the throne. And. Also, younger child expectations tend to be lowered for the younger child, I've noticed. But I love that, you know, you have that kind of hint of mischief in him that he had in the first one, too. But, you know, it's very believable that he and T'Challa would have been, would have become close after all the events of the first movie. And that he would start to see Shuri in that kind of little sister role. So I kind of loved that. It was like, okay, I said that I'd help you out, but that doesn't mean, you know, locking you up and doing everything for you. It's like, I'm advising. This is what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. And that only was he the voice of reason. I would like to point out that when he came into the meeting, he was eating a carrot. <laughs> I, was that what that was? It was a <laughs> carrot. I loved that. Also, we saw Jabari women. I was so happy. All right. We've been talking about this for an hour, so I'm just going to call it for today. Last thoughts, Chris. This is definitely going to be one that I'm going to go back and watch again. I can't wait for it to start streaming so I can sit there and really pause on all the Mayan artwork in all of its forms and just really get a sense of how beautiful it really is that i couldn't see because the film obviously can't pause in the theater but also when we're done here i'm probably going to go try to find some mayan history stuff on youtube so i can learn more about that world i loved everything about this you it's so rare that you get to see any sort of positive representation of indigenous you know mexican and central american culture the last one we really had was Apocalypto, and that one was just, hey, let's be super violent and show how, how savage the Aztec were. And with here, you know, we see this civilization, we see the people, we see just, ah, oh, I loved it all. I'm so happy. I loved the journey that Shuri went on. I thought it was a beautiful tribute to Chadwick. I'm going to watch it like 50 more times and cry. And oh, I loved this movie. I loved it so much. I enjoyed it as well. I can't wait for the stream. It's going to be interesting watching Black Panther and then how it goes straight into that. That's one of the things I, I plan on doing is watching Black Panther again. And then this film, just to see how it goes from one to the other. I know there were events in between. We had Thanos and the blip and blah, blah, blah. But just to see callbacks and references and story parallels. I was pleased to see this as the finale for phase four and not phase 400 as Michelle called it before, but I don't blame her for saying that. It's a 
fitting ending for phase four. I'm looking forward to moving ahead. We're, we're done with the grief. We're done with the new introductions. Let's move forward with story from now on. I think we got a little bit of the story and where we're going to go within the phase already. Mm, well, let's see what I think about it as we go forward. But the table is set. We're done feeling sorry for ourselves and we're going to go forward and we're going to have some fun. And we're going to see what the universe is like. As far as this movie goes, glad I saw it. Glad I saw it in the theater. It was a visual spectacle. We didn't even talk about that, but it was a visual spectacle, a lot of CGI. And I know I talked about it in terms of the fighting. We didn't get a fighting montage, but we didn't get a lot of this is how things work because we've already been there with everything. We've been there with Riri's Stark Tech type Iron Man uh, suit. We've been there with the Black Panther tech. We didn't need to go there. And even with the Namor and his people, we got the background that we needed and we didn't need to really focus on it. So I think focusing on the story was the right decision for Ryan Coogler. Really enjoyed it. And let's see what happens again. I don't know when the next time we're going to get a Black Panther led film, but I'm looking forward to seeing Black Panther and the ensemble cast as we go forward. I don't think we're done with them yet. I think we're going to get more. All right, next time, we're going to end up the year with a bang. We're going to talk about the I Am Group specials. If you haven't seen them already on Disney+, Plus, go ahead and watch them. They are cute. There's about five of them, if I remember. They're about five minutes long each. It's a good half hour to spend yeah. watching those. Three if you don't watch the credits. Yeah, <laughs> and then... We are going to be talking about the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. I've already watched it. I think everybody's already watched it. And it is well worth an extra watch. And it was just fun. And I've uh, been reading some of the interviews that James Gunn did. And he has sprinkled some seeds for the movie in this. So maybe we'll do some speculation there. In the meantime, we do have some quick news stories to go through from Marvel Studios. Coming up first, we're Wakanda Forever villain Namor, quote unquote villain, really, just can't have his own standalone Marvel movie. Looking mostly at an article from the rap.com, that's W R A P, if you're trying to look for it yourself. Namor just can't be in a Marvel movie that's just about him. That's nothing against Namor. It's nothing against what anybody thinks of the character, what they think they can do with him. They know they can do some amazing things. What you have is a Hulk type situation where Marvel just doesn't own enough of the rights and the correct rights to be able to do a solo Namor movie. Back in the 90s, when they couldn't make money, were on the verge of going bankrupt. Marvel was selling off the rights to all kinds of characters. It's how you get Sony with Spider-Man. It's how you get Universal with Hulk. And it's how you're going to end up with Namor having to be in a movie like this, where it's technically a Black Panther movie, or as like an Avengers-type movie where he's part of a group but you just are not going to get it because Universal still has the rights to Namor. Obviously, they're cool playing with Marvel. They like making money. Maybe something can get worked out in the future, but Universal is going to have to be the ones to say, Marvel, you are allowed to do this. As it stands now, the way they've set up the character, I don't see a MCU Namor-based film. I really hope he shows up in the inevitable Fantastic Four movie. Me too. Me too. I was talking about that. <laughs> Imperious <laughs> sex, y'all. Yeah, it, the article says Namor can appear in team-up films and the like, but can't star in a solo movie. So absolutely. I mean, team-up... it. Fantastic Four is basically a team-up movie to begin with, so yeah. And if we get that, I don't know if we get a Killmonger astral plane appearance or not. That would be kind of cool with the, you know, Storm. 
Johnny or uh, Michael B. Jordan coming in as uh, two characters from, you know, <laughs> the, the Fantastic Four past and Killmonger here. I mean, we've discussed it since the Black Panther movie where Michael B. Jordan has this history to him. He's not the only one. Chris Evans as well. So, yeah. Part of the fun with this, though, too, is back before Iron Man came out, there was a Namor film being worked on. Just didn't get far enough for most people to realize that it was happening. So in some universe, it's happened. If you take a look at the character like you did in Aquaman for DC, I absolutely see it. But we did not get, we got enough antagonist in Namor to be like, I don't know if I want that much of an antagonist in a lead role. Now, character could shift. You could get more of a less antagonist role or at least a neutral role going forward. And then that would indicate a solo film would be plausible. but. Nobody really wants to see an antagonist-led film. At least not with Disney. And that's another thing that I want to bring up. Just sliding it in here. I know I mentioned it before about Apple. There are rumors out there that Apple is positioning itself to buy Disney. And that was one of the reasons why we had the shift in CEO last week. That's very interesting. You talk about rights for Universal to Disney. And then you throw an apple into the whole thing. I, wow, that's a mess of companies right there. I would never thought that Apple would be doing this. But if you look at a weakened position, Disney, and the fact that Apple is transitioning from hardware towards entertainment, it actually makes sense. And they got the money to do it. So it's not without basis. Now, everybody's denying it so far, but I could see it being talked about right now. And that would make a very interesting future where agreements like this with Universal or agreements with Sony, you throw Apple into the mix. I don't know how that works. Anywho, Michelle, you want to talk about the MCU. Yes. I'm sorry. My brain is still going over like the Apple Disney thing. I did not hear that until now. Okay. Anyway, Chris Emsworth. Yes. Chris Hemsworth has played an integral role in the Marvel Cinematic Universe as Thor. The franchise star recently revealed, however, that he isn't quite up to date on all the expansive franchises, films, and Disney Plus shows. Speaking to Josh Horowitz on the Happy, Sad, Confused podcast, Hemsworth stated outright that he was unable to keep up with everything Marvel Studios has had to offer. He only recently caught an episode of the Loki series. When asked if he hadn't seen the entire show yet, the MCR explained, the MCU star explained, I've got three kids and I'm off gallivanting around the place. No, I haven't watched anything. It's not because I don't want to. I just haven't had the time. And it's interesting to know that celebrities, they're just like us. If we weren't doing this podcast, we wouldn't have seen as much as the MCU as we have, at least for me personally. I can't speak for all of you, but. I would have, but I don't have kids, and I'm a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the boat. Yeah, I'm a nerd too. But you know, with when yeah, you but you have kids. You have like you y'all. All of y'all have like jobs and stuff, and I'm <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah. yeah. So keeping up with the MCU has has not been easy. It just hasn't. It, there's been a lot of it, which is why we have the podcast. And I'm glad we were able to talk about the podcast. I was approached by somebody on Reddit that was like, okay, so who's been doing um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. podcast and can talk about it? Oh, well, yeah, I, I've been doing it. And they're like, okay, well, we'd like to have you on your show because we're doing this little snippet of an episode on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm like, okay, well, uh, we're, we're at the point where we're looking for experts in this and like historical documentaries look back on <laughs> coverage of agents of shield yeah that that's where we're at and there's just a lot to the mcu out there i feel so sorry for kids today because like people who were around like us when all this started we've just been picking it up as it went along and so we've had 30 years however many to watch everything and kids these days have to catch up 
I'm of the generation. I was alive when Star Trek, the original series was on, right? Those of us that have been alive that long were dwindling in numbers. And you talk about Star Trek, the universe, Star Wars, the universe, the MCU, which has only been going on since 2008 and everything else out there, Harry Potter. It gets to be a little bit much when you try to throw all those IPs together and, and say, OK, well, I want to. I want to know everything about it. it was so much easier when I was a kid. There was nothing. <laughs> Plus, there was a there seemed to be a thing. I don't know about when I was younger in like the the mid 90s, early 2000s. It was kind of expected like you pick one thing to like and you learn everything about it. And it's a lot easier to to be a fan of. You throw people like me who like anime and who also like uh, South Korean material, K dramas, K romance. I finally started stuff. watching K dramas. Oh, which one? Okay, I finished "Live Up to Your Name" and "Extraordinary Attorney Wu," and I'm trying to decide what to start next. There's oh, so it. much content out there. There were barely 80 movies a year back when I started going to movies, like in the mid to late 70s, early 80s, right? And now there's, well, I mean, pandemic, but before the pandemic, there was, I think, close to 400 a year movies that were coming out into the theater. You can't keep up with all that. Not all of them are good, but you just can't keep up with all that. So at some point you have to cut your losses and move on. And there's stuff that we talked about before on streaming that I, I just haven't seen. I mean. I still have Lost in Space season three to get through the rest of. I'm I'm so close to ending several, but then another good thing, like the Santa Claus series came out in Disney Plus. I'm like, ooh, shiny thing. I'm gonna watch this. And then I don't get to finish everything else out there. So Yeah, I get that. I'm trying to So in the evening while I'm winding down, I've been starting to try and like get through a bunch of my series on like Netflix and Hulu and stuff. And it's a lot less daunting when it's like a short series like right now i'm halfway through wednesday on netflix but it's it's so intimidating to try and catch up with all the stuff that i you know haven't yet gotten around to watching and i say that as someone with more spare time than pretty much everyone i know yeah because look when you get if you get into korean stuff you're like oh my goodness netflix shows are 45 minutes long Korean shows are like, hold my soju, um, mm -hmm. an episode, an episode of a K-drama can be an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. They are long. And then, for example, I'm watching The Good Detective season one and then into season two. There's 16 episodes each. That's 32. But it's not like 32 hours. It's 32 plus hours because some of those episodes have been an hour and 15 minutes. And I'm not just talking about the season finale. I'm talking about like even in the middle of it. You just never know. They're not just 60 minutes. You can, it can be an hour, four minutes, 60 minutes, like whatever. So I, I want to put that out there. Okay. <laughs> Do people are like, Ooh, they're watching Korean stuff. Maybe it is not for the lighthearted, not because of the content. The content is wonderful and surprising. It's because it is a commitment and you need to know that before you dive into that pool. And for Chris Hemsworth, who's a main MCU character, not to see what Loki, his co-star, is doing, that shows you how much content that there is and how much that these people that are involved have to pay attention to. Like, writers, like, if you're a Doctor Who writer, you literally have to go back to 1963 in order to get the entirety of the scope of what that universe is, right? If you want to write in some I'm actually going to shift and I'm going to use a Star Trek it, it, Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan doesn't happen unless somebody watches all 80 of those episodes and brings that forward right the Doctor Who stuff that's more popular and comprehensive doesn't happen unless you go back to 1963 and you move forward so yeah uh, for Chris Hemsworth not to have seen Loki says quite a bit and nothing against chris whatsoever it's just there's way too much out there all right lauren <laughs> talking about way too much out there we got more coming 
So we do. The Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 trailer dropped a couple of days ago as of us recording right now. I watched it. It's about, what, a minute and a half, a minute 50? And, okay, there's so much stuff that I just want to gush about. They're wearing the comic-accurate uniforms. Lila shows up who, if you ever played the Guardians of the Galaxy Telltale game, you might be familiar with her. We're getting more info on Rocket's backstory, so it looks like we're going to see Half-World. More Nebula and Mantis, and I'm super hyped about that always. Gamora's back. Our first look at Adam Warlock. I'm... (sighs) The Guardians movies have been so fun. And the Guardians holiday special was also incredibly fun. And I'm very, very, very hyped about this. Also, is it just me or were they dressed like Micronauts at one point? I think that was a reference to Micronauts. I could be wrong. I thought they just had uniforms. At one point, they're dressed in like these very brightly colored, looks like space suits. Okay, not micro. Well. I don't know enough about Micronauts. I guess maybe not. But they're dressed in these very bright colored spacesuits at one point. And I know it's a reference to something. And I'm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. That I, I was thinking of the when they were coming out of the ship and they were all in like the red and blue. Yeah. No, those are the comics accurate ones. If you go back and read the Dan Abnett run, they're wearing that there. They're still wearing them to this day. I'm. Ugh, I, I'm just so happy to have. The Guardians back in my life. I have been very open about loving Mantis and Nebula. Drax is fun. It'll be fun to see more young adult Groot. I'm very excited about Lila. And this is going to be it. There's going to be no more Guardians of the Galaxy after this. Because James Gunn is trying to fix DC. Well, not only that. Yeah, I think all these characters are moving on to different... Like Zoe said... Uh, the one regret I have is is wasting ten years of my life looking or uh, working with all these major things, and I didn't have a chance to spread out and do my own films and stuff like that. And I know a lot of the the stars of uh, previous action stuff that branched out and they've gone their different ways, and they were able to star in their own non action or non sci fi ish or non comic book start sort of roles. And and Zoe. She just has a regret on that. She said, I don't regret my time with these. I just regret that I didn't have time to do other things while I was doing this. So, yeah, she's, yeah, she's been part of three Star Trek Guardians and now Avatar. For those of you who don't remember Avatar, it's been like, what, 20 years or something? Yeah, everybody's uh. going to go back and, and watch the original before they go back into this. Anyway, I'm excited about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. It's going to be a fun ride. James Gunn knows how to put on a show, and he also uh, has the trust of Kevin Feige, so he was probably given a long leash, even though he was moving over to DC. I think Kevin was fine with him doing what he had to do. It's going to be fun. All right, with that, Lauren, what's up? Uh, I think we've spent a lot of time on it. I think now it's time to burn our morning stuff and get on out of here. It's been fun catching up with the MCU. Really appreciate you listeners sticking with us the entire time. Thank you very much. And we're looking forward to your takes on the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special next time. Thank you to all of my co-hosts for being so amazing and putting in so much work and being so incredibly awesome. I love hearing what y'all think of everything every week. I love hopping on to talk with y'all every week. Thank you so much. Dear listener, if you have made it this far, you deserve all the gold stars. Definitely 400 of them. We always appreciate interaction that we have. Our Discord server 
very active. Not only do we have a channel for the podcast, Legends of Shield, sometimes the talk goes into our TV and film channel. And then, of course, we have a spoiler channel where we can just talk about everything that's happened. Yes, every minute that you spend with us, we know is something that you could be spending somewhere else, but we're glad you're spending it with us and deciding that our content in this overwhelming abundance of content is what you want to spend your time on. And we appreciate every second of that. Indeed. And until next time, I'm going to take a short trip to MIT and see Riri, but we'll see everybody next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Podcasting your pajamas is fun. It is. Saturday morning cartoons with Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2022.